Niagara Falls, New York, August 1978. What happened here, you might ask yourself, as you make your way through the cracked and pitted streets of the neighborhood once called Love Canal? Deadly chemicals seeping out of an abandoned waste dump called the Love Canal. The houses are empty, abandoned in haste before boards could even be put over windows or padlocks latched on doors. This modern day ghost town. It's a post-apocalyptic playground where you can pretend you're the last human on earth after everyone just suddenly disappeared. Toxic waste. It looks like it was a perfectly fine neighborhood at one point. Rows of sturdy middle-class houses that not too long ago were well cared for and maintained are now being claimed by nature. More than 80 types of chemicals. No doubt it was a splendid proud community before whatever happened, happened. And what happened here in Love Canal? Love Canal happened. They didn't care what they dumped, they dumped indiscriminately. Two words, love canal, that are now synonymous with two words, toxic waste. And there's a passage. And it all began in the 1940s, when Hooker Chemical Company found an unfinished, half-dug canal and started burying its chemical waste. Well, oh, here's where it all began. Just how did it start? A decade later, a prosperous city of Niagara Falls was growing. Yeah pushing development into that same area where tons of chemicals percolated underground. Houses were built along the canal, which had since been filled in and capped with clay, and a school was placed directly upon the most potent section of the tomb of toxicity. Before long, kids' eyes were burning, babies were being born all messed up, hearts had holes in them and rocks would just burst into flames on a hot day. The residents were thinking, Something Mama. stinks around here. Chemicals. And after the blizzard of 77, the water table rose, lifting black sludge from the buried broken barrels into the lawns, basements, and pipes of the homes. There was no denying it. Love Canal was being overrun by poison. This little corner of Niagara Falls, New York, was declared a federal health emergency, and the sweet little neighborhood was evacuated. With toxic waste, there's no real cleaning up, only moving it around and containing it. So in that same ground, the waste remains, reigning victorious. Their houses now stand abandoned. After all these years, the homes still stand in the neighborhood they called Love Canal as a public memorial of ruins, contaminated by chemicals or by stigma. You'll be amazed and creeped out by day but terrified beyond tolerable levels once the sun goes down. Driving through at night, you'll see only the shadows of deserted houses for blocks and blocks, overgrown and dark. Dark, that is, except for one house. There are about 239 homes, uh, 237 residents have now evacuated. A single home remains where the light still glows with a lawn still mowed, with chickens gathered within their titular wire, and with footprints in the oily mud leading back and forth from the mailbox. Who lives there? Did everybody get out? No, there are still who live in what they consider ring to the homes across the street from the actual canal. But do you have any communication with them? Uh, no, we don't. I think there's a problem who here. Who lives there? The house belongs to one stubborn resident who didn't want to leave Love Canal who didn't want to believe there was a crisis. It's all in their heads, he says. And who's to argue that? No one, since there's no one left to argue with. He's perfectly content on his own, clipping box scores from newspapers, playing military board games by mail, and walking from one side of the room to the other side of the room. Master by default he is of this village of one. He will only know loneliness if reminded that there are others out there in the world. So he doesn't venture far. And he has ensured that he doesn't have to. 
He eats the chickens and their eggs, jars, cans, and seasons from his garden, lives off the grid, completely self-sufficient, so there's no reason to leave the quarter acre of his own property. But then came the avian flu. In just a matter of weeks, the bird flu wiped out his coop. Without his chickens and chicken-based products, it was a really rough winter. By February, he was starving. His muscle tissue was eating other muscle tissue and whatever else it could find. And he finally broke down. He decided it was time to stray from home in search of food from the outside world. He looked up the word food in the yellow pages. First listing will do. Letter A, Arby's. Maybe I can fire up the old pickup truck and see if she'll get me to this here Arby's, he told himself. He dusted off his keys and headed for the door. But as he approached it, he noticed that from the green foamy cracks in the wood grain on the door, an abundance of mushrooms had grown. It was as if the door was saying, stay here, I can provide you with food. And he knows this very particular kind of mushroom. It's chicken of the woods, or chicken of the door in this case. He cut off a piece of it using his long, sharp fingernail and took a bite. It was the most delicious, meaty ear of food he's ever nibbled on. Forget Arby's. He didn't have to leave after all. He had enough food right here at his doorstep. As the days went on, his house sprouted more and more mushrooms of all varieties. Argaric, Boletus, Holy Poor, Basidio Mycotina, Basidio Mycetes. They grew on the inside of the house and on the outside of the house, too. Enough to eat for the rest of his life. The teenagers, punks, who would drive through Love Canal for ruckus, noticed his new fungal home and gave it the nickname The Mushroom House. And now they finally had a name for the guy inside of it, the Lord of the Mushroom House. Chicken of the woods, hen of the woods, lion's mane, shiitake. He had quite the delicacies. Our mushroom lord can make a fortune down at the farmer's market. That's exactly what he thought, too. So he started foraging around the house, bagging up sack after sack of mushrooms, Once I get these to the farmer's market, I'm going to be rich, he shouted. As he was about to leave, he could feel that the walk across the room was different, softer. He looked down, and the floorboards were blooming in a glowing moss. He bent to it, and the moss smelled like Bengay, but it looked like gold. Upon further examination, he discovered that it was gold, real gold. Golden moss was growing from his floor. He didn't need to leave the house to sell shrooms for cash. He had all the riches he could ask for growing right under his feet. He had heard of this process in one of his crazy person magazines. Phytomining, it's called, where plants extract precious metals from the soil and emerge dressed in the stuff. Either that's what was happening, or all those chemicals that have accumulated in his house for decades have evolved into sentient matter and they were providing him with whatever he needed. A bonkers notion, but he considered it anyway and tested the theory, starting light at first. Ah, I hate water, and I wish I didn't have to drink it, he said, loud enough for his poisoned house to hear. Immediately, his sink turned on all by itself. Gooey pink stuff bubbled from the tap. He took a sip, and felt quenched. Forever, his new self-hydrating body no longer needed to drink the sulfury stink water that had been running from his taps for years. Then he asked for a new set of teeth to replace his lack of them. And teeth grew from crystals forming on the battery on the back of his fridge. He was on a roll. He asked for a new jacket. I always wanted one of those suede jackets, he said. Maybe one that says Niagara Falls City Champion on the back of it. 
And before he could even finish his request, fine hairs on weird brown spores on the shower walls began to weave themselves together, producing the coolest suede jacket in town. Brown sleeves, black back and breast, it undulated out of the bathroom and climbed onto its new proud owner. And then came a big one. You know what he said? I'm sick of people thinking they're smarter than me. I want a new brain. A better one, a brain full of smartness. He waited in silence. Then he heard the creaking of ceiling joists. Above him, a bulge was pulsating, ballooning out from the drywall. The latex paint was like a boil. Then it was like a boil, the size of a softball. Something was growing, moving inside of the ceiling, ready to burst out. The stretched layer of paint split open and a blue human brain landed with a padded plop onto the worn pleather lazy boy. It was a new brain, sharper than the brain who had thought of replacing itself. This model was specifically built to enhance tactical play in strategic war games like Stratego, Risk, and Axis and Allies. Uh, hi, this is Dr. Clint from the Department of Actual Doctors. Just returning your call, and yes, it is indeed possible to perform brain transplant surgery yourself at home. Just know that you will need to cut the new brain into 16 chunks. I can provide some charts and uh, replace your old brain one piece at a time, moving front to back. You can't just take the whole brain out and put the new one in, because the second you take your whole brain out, you won't work anymore. As another option, I could do the surgery for you at my office for the low cost of $29.95. That's a one-time introductory offer. Just give me a call back. Let's chat. Love, Clint. Soon his house was overflowing with new belongings. It was like he won a dang showdown showcase. And it was also overflowing with toxic ooze as well. As it used its chemical abilities, to manufacture whatever it's lowered required. Stuff and ooze. Ooze and stuff. I have everything I want and no one to share it with. Yeah. Bring me friends, he demanded. And through the door walked in a bunch of no-good young punks, in a trance, lured in by the horny scent of the chloroquine flower. Finally, real people to play battleship with and they played all night long, until he kicked them out under a sudden gust of deep ennui. You'll note here that the punks have no agency of their own. They are being mind-controlled by the chemical aroma. They are not your real friends. Only the toxic waste is your friend. But I can be your friend, too, for just nine ninety-five a month. I will arrive at your home with... He was feeling a little dissatisfied, bored. It's no good having all of this stuff, he said. This jacket, this Subaru. I have some nice new cups. And being stuck inside with it, he said. And that's when he made the ultimate request. I want to leave. And the toxic waste responded, but not like it had before. This time, it spoke. But we love you, Mr. Lord. We will give you everything you desire. As long as you stay right here, with us. Burial of such waste has been common in America for decades. The problem, it turns out, is that the chemicals don't stay buried forever. Now he sits, lording over his dump from upon a reclining throne. Leaving, he surmised, was not an option. 
especially not now, as his feet had become tethered to the house from black plastic gummy bands formed from toxic deposits. Yes, the chemical genie still provides him with the chocolates and CDs that he now unenthusiastically wishes for. But the one thing it won't grant him is his freedom. Freedom. 